you to turn with me tonight to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and we're going to go to verse 12. This is an extremely popular passage of Scripture, but I want to use this tonight to launch into what I believe God laid on my spirit for this particular event tonight. When you've got that, say amen. Say amen. How many brought a Bible with you? Get your sword with you? Ever, have, ever take part in a sword drill? I used to win chocolate bars for that kind of thing. I used to do that. It's awesome. Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 12, the writer of Hebrews puts it like this. For the word of God is quick, or alive, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And with the power of the Holy Ghost tonight in his word, I want to preach to you from this title, There's No Substitute for a Sword. There's no substitute for a sword. Would you lift up your hands tonight in the in the presence of the Lord, and would you ask Jesus to let this word touch your heart? Would you ask the Lord to let this word cut you in your heart and in your spirit that it makes a forever change? In you, Jesus, we come before you, God. We come before you. We submit our hearts, our minds, our will to you, and we bow before the word of the Lord. We give it our attention. We open our spirit tonight, God, so we can have an internal impact, eternal impact upon us. And we give you praise, and we give you glory, and we pray a manifestation of the mighty word of God would happen in this room tonight. And would somebody say in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I'm, I'm confident you have probably heard of the Bible app YouVersion. Who has YouVersion on your phone? I've got it on my, my personal phone and I have it on my, my work phone. On, on Bible, on YouVersion, they currently have 2,013 versions of the Bible in 1,343 languages, including 527 audio Bibles in 417 languages. That's as December of 2020. YouVersion, as of December 2020, has been downloaded over 450 million times. In 2020 alone, 52 million plus installs were downloaded. 1.4 million day uh, play plans were completed. 7.5 audio, million audio chapters were played. 99 million videos were played. 2.5 billion highlight, billion highlights, bookmarks, and notes. 524 million total verses shared. Seems like a lot of word going out. However, recent studies have suggested in the past year the total engagement of the scriptures is down. Features that increase engagement don't always deepen our experiences. Opening a Bible app, and I do it at 845 this morning, you version sent me the verse of the day. But opening a Bible app doesn't equal meaningful, enriching engagement has taken place in your life. It's easy to fall into a rhythm of reading your Bible's app's version of the verse of the day and calling that good enough. In the last year and a half, you've probably heard of this thing called a pandemic, in the last year and a half, we have become more spiritually disengaged, and early researches suggest our reading and our Bible reading and study habits has declined. Barna Group, who is a research and uh, resource organization for faith and culture, along with the American Bible Society, reported that Bible reading actually dropped during the pandemic and social distancing. Bursting the bubble that 
so many people like to use is, I'd read the Bible if I had more time. You had all kinds of time to read the Word. It's where you put your time that, that's got you. You know, I come to tell somebody here tonight, and I've come to tell my generation and those listening, that the devil does not care if you download a Bible app on your phone. He does not want you to download the Word into your heart. We need some apostolic, Bible-believing young people and adults. I'm not throwing the students under the bus because we got a lot of Facebook users in the older demographic. But if you will be as intent on downloading Scripture into your heart and into your soul, as Scripture tells us in Psalm 119 and 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If there is a pandemic, if there is something that is extremely wrong right now and how I feel in my soul is that there is a void of people who actually have the word of God hidden in their heart. And we talk about mission. And we talk about reaching the lost. And we talk about the gospel. Let me tell you something. You can't do any of that with a Bible app. You can't do any of that with a, uh, your tablet. You need the word of God in your heart. You need it in your heart. You shouldn't have to always fumble through the apps on your phone to try to find a verse of Scripture. I believe you can get to a place in your walk with God where you can call some Scriptures out of the heart that you've been putting them into and use them as seasons that God has for you. In 1588, I don't think anyone was alive then, If you are, we want to know the fountain of youth you've been drinking from. In 1588, Japan's imperial leader, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, wanted to guarantee his position as leader by calling on something referred to as a sword hunt. What that sword hunt looked like is this. Sending his men throughout the country and taking the swords out of the hands of the people, he was ensuring he would have victory and leadership over them. Because his mindset was this. If you remove the sword, you remove the threat. If the devil can take the sword out of your soul, if he can take the sword of the Spirit out of your hand, he's, he's taken the threat away. He's taken the very thing that takes him down. He's taken it out of the way. Remove the sword and you've removed the threat. You know, the Israelites had something similar happen to them in their history. 1 Samuel chapter 13, the New Living Translation writes it this way. Verse 19, there were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them to for fear that they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, sickles, uh, they had to take them to the Philistine blacksmith. The charges were as follows. A quarter of an ounce of silver for sharpening a plowshare or a pick. An eighth of an ounce for sharpening an axe or, and ma or making the point of an axe goad. So on the day of battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or a spear except for Saul and Jonathan. 
if there's ever a tactic, if there's ever an agenda, if there's ever a force that's driving hell in this day and age, it's to do one thing and one thing only to my generation. At all costs, keep the sword out of those apostolics' hands. Whatever you've got to do, however you've got to distract them, however you have to get their eyes out of that book, however you have to throw flashy things on the tablet, on the phone, on the TV, on Facebook, with relationships, hell, whatever you've got to do, you make sure you keep the sword out of those kids' hands. Because if they ever get a sword, If they ever get a sword, we're done. If they ever pick up that weapon, we're over. We've got to make sure we keep the sword out of their hand. Woo! I want to tell somebody in this house, those distractions that come into your mind during church or at home or when you find yourself alone, they're just not whimsical. They are methods of the adversary to keep you occupied so you never put your face in the word of God and get ground and sharpen the sword and move the kingdom of God forward. Let's slap our hands unto the Lord right now and give him praise. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room right now. Ah. I believe perhaps the pandemic positioned Satan with the opportunity of his lifetime in existence. The most widespread and available weapon to take away from the children of God, the Word. He's comfortable with you having church. He's fine with you clapping your hands and shouting amen. He's all right with you getting your praise on at a youth convention. He's all right if you get motivated here this weekend, but he does not want you to leave equipped this weekend. We have to translate our motivation into equipping ourselves that when we leave this youth convention, it wasn't necessarily all about the clap, the hype, the song, interaction. But when we were there, we picked up a sword. We picked up a word. We picked up a weapon. We picked up something that when we get home, we've got something to swing. We've got something to use. Ah! Let me tell you, that jump in here, it won't free you or give you power. But I know what does when you reach down into the heart that you've been putting the word in and you extract the sword of the spirit and you begin to fight. Use that sword. So if you really want to shake up hell and you really want revival and you really want to on fire, walk with the Lord, I give you a challenge. You need to become acquainted with the word of God in this hour like you've never been equipped. You have never been in favor of it before. You need to have a relationship with that word. You know, it still works. It still works. It does the job. It cuts. It convicts. It heals. It saves. It does the job. You don't have to substitute that. You don't have to put that down. You don't have to replace it with some gimmick. All you got to do is get yourself alone with it and get a hold of the word and let it begin to do a work through you. And you'll see God do something in your family. Hell hates the word, everybody. He hates it. Why does he hate it? Simple. It defeats him. Why does he hate the word so much? Simple. It defeats him. It beats him. Let that set in for a minute. What destroys? What what beats our adversary? It's the word. It's the word. I tell you a phrase. 
that drives the devil nuts. Because he hates the word, it defeats him. It trumps him, it stumps him, he, he can't get away from it, he can't get around it, he, he's, it corners him. And a phrase that drives the devil crazy is when he hears a child of God in the middle of temptation, in the middle of trial, when he hears a young person who's struggling, when he's, he thinks he's got the upper hand, when he hears somebody begin to utter the words, it is written. You want to drive hell crazy? Hey, hey, what? When you say it is written, it reminds him of a conversation he had back with Jesus back in the gospel when he tried to defeat the Lord. And every time it is written. I want to preach to somebody in this room. You better leave this, uh, this youth convention with an it is written in your soul, in your spirit. Uh, that way when hell comes knocking uh, on your door next week, no, 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 no. I, I, hey, hey, it is written. It frustrates him. It fires him up because when you begin to quote the book and put the sword in his face, he's... You win. He's going to tap out. You win. When you use the word, you win. Let's clap our hands on the Lord right now. Woo! Yeah. God's trying to wake us up in this hour. God's trying to shake us in this time to get a hold of the Word of God like we've never hooked on to it before. Because when there's a mission to execute, when there's a war to fight, and when battles are ensuing, and chaos is everywhere, and people are panicking, you need something that's going to win. You can't, listen. I believe that this generation is positioned for revival. I, I, I do it. We've, God's blessed us at LCC. We had a pandemic. Things went crazy. We gained some and lost some. But guess what? I'm thankful we baptized three people earlier this spring in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, uh, for the remission of their sins. Uh, let me take it a, a little further. We had people afflicted, one gentleman with cancer, and we prayed for him and prayed for him and believed the word for him. And he had some, some tests and some scopes since he had some procedures take place. After a while, we got a good report. There's no cancer in him, and he's cancer-free. When you start to use the sword... When you start to use the sword, stuff starts happening. Stuff starts shaping up. God's got a mission for my generation, and you cannot fulfill the mission without the word of God. You can't do it. You'll lose. You can be seated. You'll lose. I wouldn't say I'll be a loser. You'll be a loser. That's still a thing? I don't know. You won't win. Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, verse 12. The children of the, Lord, of the Lord of Israel, pardon me, again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered himself the people of Ammon and Amalek and went and defeated Israel. And took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel, get this, served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. It's a long time. But they, they came to their senses. They cried unto the Lord and raised, and God raised up a deliverer for them. Ehud, the son of Gura, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man, by him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. He was a lefty. 
He was an oddball. Sorry. Any lefties? I love you. Really, you're awesome. You ambidextrous people, you freak me out, but lefties. You see, lefties were not that common, and it was actually seen as a defect back in the Bible times. I'm sorry. You know, my left, my left arm, really, in hand, it's just on my body to make me appear normal. That's all. <laughs> That's the reason why I've got one right there. So Ehud is called upon God to be a deliverer for his people. And a part of Ehud's responsibilities was pretty grueling, actually. He, he, he had to appease the Moabite king by bringing his people's resources and giving them to him for tribute in exchange for relative peace. So he had the wonderful job of collecting the hard-earned uh, resources of his countrymen, putting them together, and taking them into the king's presence for him to accept in exchange for what he wanted for his people was peace. That had to be a hard job. That had to be difficult. That, that had to be something that Ehud did not want to do, was taking a tribute of a hard-armed people, the resources of his countrymen, and, and giving it away to a heathen pagan king. But God was going to use an unlikely person to do something amazing, probably in a job that they didn't like. And the Lord had a plan for him. And the plan was to be a deliverer. Let me tell you this, and I believe this wholeheartedly. Some of the difficult, hated areas of your life might be where God wants to use you most. Some of the places you wish didn't exist may be the place where revival does exist. And it's a concept that we have to let God work us through. So he's, he's commissioned by God to be a deliverer for the Israelites. He's got a mission. He's got something to do for, for his people. He has God calling him. And I believe there's a call of God in this room tonight. But before Ehud gathered the tribute and ventured off to Eglon, the Bible says he made himself a dagger. It's the same Hebrew word for sword. In the scriptures. So before he set out to fulfill the mission that God had for him, Ehud made a sword. If I'm going to do this, Ehud said, I better bring a sword with me. If I'm going to fulfill the mission that God's put on my shoulders, I better bring a sword with me. So he had to go home and spend time making an 18-inch sword that he could conceal on his body to take into the presence of King Eglon and wait for his moment to use the sword to gain victory for his people. So the sword's crafted, it's put together, and it's, it's on the way to King Eglon, on his right thigh, because he is a left-handed person. Lefties would reach... To their right thigh for their sword, righties would, if you're smart, reach to their. And given the fact that the majority of the people who were swordsmen in this time period were right handers, no one would have expected this unassuming left handed guy to have a sword on him. But sometimes you unassuming young people, Sometimes the ones who feel they're handicapped when they compare themselves to others. Sometimes the youth, the student, the mom or the dad, when they look around and compare themselves with everyone else and I don't have what they have, listen, God can use you in ways he can't use them. So Ehud is on the way. He's headed into He's headed into Moab. He's headed to see Eglon. And the scripture says in verse 13, or verse 17 of Judges 3, he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. And the Bible just throws this in there that Eglon was a very fat man. <laughs> the word is powerful. 
So scripture says he finds himself into the presence of King Eglon. So he is getting closer to the enemy with a sword that is hidden that the adversary has no idea is there. The enemy didn't see it coming. And when he finished presenting the tribute that he had brought from Israel, when he finished giving that, the Bible says he sent the people away who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal, and he said, I have a secret message for you, O king. You see, he's getting ready right now to fulfill the plan of God that God gave him. He says to King Eglon, I, I, I've got a, I got a message from God for you. And he said, keep silence. This is Eglon. And all who attended him went out from him. And so Ehud came to him. And now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. And then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And at that moment, Eglon stands to his feet. And he positions himself in front of Ehud. And it's at this moment that it would appear that it's just one man facing another man. But if I could stretch you a little bit, it was one kingdom facing another kingdom. It wasn't just one man to a man. It was was one kingdom squaring off against another kingdom. And as Eglon is waiting to hear the message from God, he he just stands up in this arrogant posture and pride. And what's God going to tell me? The scripture says that Ehud reached with his left hand and he took the dagger from his right thigh. And excuse the graphic nature of scripture, he thrust it into his belly, even to the hilt after the blade and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw out the dagger from his belly and the entrails came out. It's quite vivid. You know, when Ehud told Eglon, I have a message from God for you. That's the last thing Ehud says. He doesn't speak anymore. He simply reaches to the hidden place. And he pulls out the sword he'd been carrying the whole time. Whoo! And as one kingdom squares off against another, one full of pride and arrogance and dominance, feeling like he has the upper hand on this poor Israelite. Believe me, the last thing Eglon would have, been, would have wanted was to be alone with an Israelite with a hidden sword. The last thing Satan wants is to be you and somebody else who you're reaching or somebody else you're praying for or something you're trying to do in the kingdom of God. He don't want you to be alone with a hidden sword. So all the work, all the planning, all the payoff was about to happen. Ehud reaches in and he extracts that sword and he thrusts it into the stomach, into the the kingdom that was opposing the Israelite people. And he gives it a, a death blow. Ehud didn't have to say anything when he said, hey, Eglon, I, I got a word from God for you. All, all Ehud did is, is he let the sword do all the talking. <laughs> He let, he let the sword uh, do, do all the talking. Uh, he just said, hey, 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 I, gotta, I got something for you right now. Eglon, uh, let me introduce you to a sword I've been carrying for quite some time, getting ready to deliver this into your kingdom to free my people, to get them out of your hands, to give them deliverance, uh, to let them be free, uh, to get them away from you. Let me give you something that will free my people. And Ehud pulled the sword out. And it said, hey, I don't have to say anything. I'm going to let the sword do all the talking in this interaction. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise in this room right now. Woo! 
You've got to hear me right now. You can carry a sword around with you that when hell is all over your life and trying to con convince you that you're not worthy and, and God don't love you and there is no revival and you're all washed up if you would do yourself a great favor and reach into the heart of where you kept the word of God and pull that out and deliver a death blow to the adversary with the sword of the Spirit. Clap your hands unto the Lord right now and shout unto God. <laughs> Woo. Just for a minute longer, do that, would you? Alamando kosanda la bakaye robokosa. I can tell somebody, you, you've got to start using the sword. You, you've got a mission from God, and you've been doing it all wrong. You, you can't just leave the sword at home. Ehud would have been helpless and defenseless, but he brought the sword he made before he left. Listen, before God ever plants you on a mission field, before God ever puts you in a place to do his work, you better be spending time before you leave fashioning a sword to take with you to deliver to the adversary. Do you realize that the Bible declares the word of God to be the sword of the spirit? And I believe in my heart of hearts that there are students, young adults, maybe pastors and youth pastors, that you are bound and oppressed by the adversary. And you have not been using the word of God to fight him back. You have not been thrusting the sword back at him. But I believe wholeheartedly that maybe some of you are convinced I'll always be this way. I'll never be free. I'll always have to deal with what I'm dealing with. Let me tell you, there's a sword. <laughs> there's no deliverance without a sword. I'll say that again, young person. There's no deliverance without a sword. There's no freedom in your life without a sword. There's no victory in your praise without a sword. I tell you, Psalm 107 and verse 20, the scripture says, He sent His word and He healed them. And He delivered them from their destructions I've come in this room to these young people to you and to tell you this first and foremost there is a delivering sword in this atmosphere for you at this very moment that I'm preaching At this very moment, there is a sword of deliverance that is in this atmosphere. And God has about, he's coming through for you. I want to tell someone in this room, your deliverance can happen right at this very moment. Would you lift up your hands all across this place? Would you lift up your hands all across this place? Would you lift up your voice right now? There's a sword of deliverance in this room right now. It's all right, we're going to take a minute. You just seek God for a minute. Let the Holy Ghost settle upon this room. God's going to set some people free right now. God's going to, he's going to have some deliverance in this room right now.
You can't substitute this any other way. There's got to be a sword in this room right now that cuts you free from your depression, that pulls you out of your oppression, that gives you joy, that gives you gladness, that gives you anointing, that, that, that lets you receive the Holy Ghost, that makes you become healed, that gives you vibrancy in your walk with God. There's a sword in this room. When you're tormented by fear, there, 1 John 4 and 18, there is no fear in love. Let's swing that sword. But perfect love casts out all fear. Let me talk to somebody. You're afraid. You're scared. This past year and a half has been horrible. You hear me right now. You don't have to be bound by fear any longer. There is an anointing in this room. If you were, you help me out here. If you're struggling with fear, I want you to quote that verse of scripture right now. I want you to read that right now. And I want you to begin to worship God as you read that and believe for deliverance. There's a sword. Deliverance. If you're battling fear in this moment, God can give you peace and he will. Some of you feel like there's no hope. Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Let me preach to somebody who you've been walking around condemned, feeling unloved, that God's forgotten about you, that life's not worth it, that I should give up. There's a sword of deliverance in the house right now. God sent a sword to deliver you. Put that next verse of scripture up for me. Some of you need to realize, you need to understand that there is freedom. There is freedom for you. There is, there is freedom for you. You don't got to stay there. There's freedom for you. The word says, if the son therefore shall make you free, you are free indeed. Ah, would you raise your hands all across this place? We're not there yet. Raise your hands all across this room. You feel that? Okay. I, I, I know we have stuff to take care of and we got pledges to fill out, but I'm captivated right now by the Holy Ghost that, that there are some young people in this room right now. You are so bound up with, with being full of fear. You are so restricted. You need delivered. You need God to free you. You, you need the Holy Ghost and the Word to cut all of those things that are entangled in your life away from you. It ain't going to happen in a self-help book. It won't happen with your buddies it'll happen when you use the word let me give you something right now I wish you'd get this in your spirit because greater is he Greater is he who is in you.
been he that is in the world. That's just not something to make you feel good or clap your hands. That's to give you confidence that you can be free. There's no substitute for a sword. If you in your life right now if you in your life right now need deliverance in your in, in any situation Whether you're struggling with addiction, whether you're battling with depression, I'm not downplaying that. Those are real things. Oppression, addiction, stuff's going on that you, you're constricted. Lies from the adversary telling you you'll never make it. If you are battling anything that you need deliverance from, I wonder right now if you'd raise your hands. I can't ignore what I feel God put in my heart. We've got some young people and some adults who you need deliverance in your life. And like psalmist, the psalmist wrote, he sent the word to give healing, to give deliverance for you. Satola shakaraya. Rebe sotoko bakasaya. Ha. I, I need some of you who know how to use the sword to use it for a moment right now. I, I need some of you who know how to use the word to pray the word and pray in the spirit right now. There are some people who need deliverance. There are some people who need free. There are some people who have addictions, all manner of things, pornography. You have addictions in your life. So Radasha Korebeka Soto. Hilo Shataya Rabaka Sataya. All right, all right, all right. If you will come, we're going to do something a bit different. If you raise your hand and you need deliverance in your life, you need a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost, you need to have some things removed, you need to get some things out. If you raise your hand, I, I want to know if you all would come to the front, those of you who raised your hands, anyone in your life that you need deliverance, I want you to come. I want you to come. No shame in this. No shame in this. It's all right. You're my hero if you're coming. It's also toko rabasataya. Youth pastors, if you've got kids and students at this altar, you better be down here with them because they need your hands right now. Elders, pastors, if you'll help us, we need your hands right now. I want you to raise your hands all across this room right now. Let's have that atmosphere again. If you need Jesus Christ to deliver you, to loose chains from you, to break bondage in your life. I want you to raise your hands 
And I guarantee you there's one thing the devil does not want you to do, and that is raise your voice. If he can bind up your tongue, I would dare say he has a a stronghold over you. If he can keep your mouth closed, he, whoo, if he can keep your mouth closed, he has power over you. He shota rebeke sikote, riba seneke iseto, riba katatai. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. And begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the authority of your spirit, and by the power of the sword of the spirit, be delivered in the name of Jesus Christ. Lift up your voice, lift up your hands, Hataya laba sataya. Exercise the sword. Come on now, let that be an anointed apostolic prayer from your soul. We need your help. Anybody in there, if you can get up here, please come. We need you to lay hands on people. We need you to help us pray people through to deliverance. God's going to give some of you your identity back tonight. You're going to pray back through to a child of God. You're going to be born again by the Spirit in this room right now. I believe God's going to restore you. If you are backslidden, you are not You are not meant to go outside. This is the place for you right here, right here. That's it, that's it, that's it. Don't you worry about what people say, what they think. Don't you worry about that. You you, you need to get what you need right now from the Holy Ghost. You need the delivering hand of the Word of God to come right now. Don't you worry about what people say. Rebe Soto, ma, 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 you should see what I see. I see people crying out to the Lord. I see restoration happening. I see people praying back through the Holy Ghost. I see callings being realized. I see peace being restored. I see worship being restored. I see hope in this place. Ataya tato shataka rabasataya.